I never know if we're going live. Is this gonna tell me that I'm live? Oh, we're on, baby. We're on. I need to check if I'm live, Mr. D. Burke. No, no. Twitch.tv slash Mr. D. Burke. Yes, we are. We're on. Um, I'm going to put this over here. We're going to have a fun one today. Building some materials for a new course that I've built. So, let me get this up. I'll get in here. We'll make a new note. Stream. What's the day? To do. So this is what we're doing. To do, um, figure out TensorFlow data sets for notebook 07. Making TensorFlow course materials. See the course, yeah. This is what we're doing. QTF GitHub. Boom. Um, try out mixed precision training for model in 07. Save model in 07. Best performing for use later, okay. We'll zoom right in on that. Boom, there we go. And I'm just gonna share this. I'm going live on Twitch. Need to text the Discord. We're on, fish on. Maybe even a, maybe even a Twitter. All right, what's up viewers? Let me know if you can hear this. So we've got a few things to do. I'm gonna get out of a couple of uh, notebooks. Here we go. So working in CoLab, we're trying to build a model. There's a paper we're trying to beat and it's deep food. I don't know when it's from, but long story short, I wanna get rid of that. There we go. Here's what we're trying to beat. Actually, beat, beat deep food paper for food recognition. So this is the fun part about deep learning and model building, is you can build some cool models and beat food, beat 
technical papers pretty quickly if you do some good shit. So yada yada yada. Where's the result? So here's the CNN. Here we go. Inception model, very similar to the Inception model. Previous layer, it spreads out into conv, conv, max pool, conv, 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 feature concatenate layer. Model connection, a lot going on there. Results, that's what we want. Hey, Yuchi, Yash, what's going on, my friend? Thank you so much. If you're, yeah, if you're joining, let me know if the audio is all good and the video is all good. Um, because I can't hear myself talk. Well, I can, but I can't hear it through the stream. Here we go. Food 101. This is the data set that we're going to use. Beat, beat deep food paper model for food recognition results on food 101. So the top one accuracy, the best I got was 77.4. 70, and that was top one accuracy and 93.5 top five accuracy. See, the top five accuracy is whenever I saw this, top one and top five accuracy. So the top five is because softmax, the softmax outputs multiple different, outputs a prediction probability for every class that you have in your data set. So for food 101, it's 101. The top five accuracy is did the target class appear in the top five predictions? So it basically gets like five shots at predicting. So the top one accuracy is did the top one softmax output pr prediction probability match the, uh, the target class? So this is what we're trying to beat. 77.4% top accuracy. And who knows, we might beat top five accuracy as well. 77.4% top one accuracy. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. So I've got a notebook here. So previously in previous notebooks for food vision. So the background to this is in the TensorFlow course GitHub. Um, oh no, GitHub TensorFlow Deep Learning. There's three notebooks here which to do with transfer learning. So 04, 05, 06. So this is what we're working on. We're working on number seven. So I'll write it here. We're working on notebook number 07 of the course. Linked above. So in previous notebooks, we've downloaded a data set directly from Google Storage, so something that I've hosted. But now I want to, I want to use TensorFlow data sets. So I'm gonna put a big to-do here. So this is, this is what we want, TensorFlow data sets. Figure out TensorFlow data sets. And we'll go here, down here. Beat deep food paper. So the number one thing is to use TensorFlow data sets. So I kind of worked this out yesterday, but TK, use TensorFlow data sets to download data. So TensorFlow data sets is a whole bunch of data sets that are stored in TensorFlow. They just give you really quick access to everything in like Tensor format. So if you see here, they've got a whole bunch of pre-made data sets ready. So these are, so you can quickly practice building your models. There's COCO, which is COCO data set, which is object recognition, object detection, object segmentation. Um, but the one we're after is food 101. There we go. Okay, so if we import this data set from TensorFlow, then what we wanna do is build a model that uses, I wanna also try mixed precision training. So we'll see what that is in a second. And we want to build, make sure our model beats the deep food paper, the food recognition results on food 101. 
top one accuracy. And then we save our model, of course. So let's see how this works. See if my code from yesterday works. Is the data set where after available? So to load it in, this is what, what it looks like. Can you see that? I'm gonna zoom in here. Thank you very much, the tattoos technologist, and thank you, uh, Hasmonator. Hasmonator, beautiful. Hey, Hasmonator, will this um? Can you what? How do you rewatch these things? Are they just back on Twitch? I'm not very familiar with how Twitch works. Like, does it live on Twitch for a while, or so? You say you come back in a few hours. Will you just be able to watch the vod of it later? I'm not entirely sure. I'm still a novice with Twitch, but I want to get better because it helps me, whenever I code uh, live, it helps me to explain what I'm doing, even if I'm not entirely sure what's going on. So if anyone knows how to watch these streams later, let me know. Okay, so this is what we wanna do. We wanna load in, when you load in the data set from TFDS, so by the way, TensorFlow datasets is imported as TFDS. I might move this over here, and I'll go to bear, move bear over here. Okay, beautiful. I'll put this here as well. What we're doing. So Yuchi, the, the Twitch me. So from what I hear, Twitch is a lot smoother than YouTube. Is that true? Like I think the, the stream quality is a lot better on Twitch than it is on YouTube. So here's what we're doing. This is going to take a while because it has to download into Colab. So I'm going to run this. Downloading and preparing data set. Wonderful. So the way TFDS loads is this kind of, the documentation on TensorFlow data sets is actually quite trash. But the way you kind of work it out, you load the data set that you want, which is in a big list of data sets here. So... TensorFlow datasets module, and you come down here. And the way you load a pre-made data set, of course, if you don't want to um, use a TensorFlow dataset, you don't have to, but this is just so you can practice writing TensorFlow model code if you import an existing data set, rather than having to import your own data. But, so you just load it in here, you get the name of it, you put the string name here. The splits I want, this is kind of weird as well. So the split, you have to tell it what splits you want. And there's actually not much documentation on what splits are available with each data set. So it's kind of, you kind of have to guess and check. I found out before, like if I change this to train and test of the Food 101 data set, it only comes with train and validation. So there's only a training and a validation set. If I want to shuffle the files, so by default, the training data set is shuffled, but this, I read in the documentation that if you pass shuffle equals true, it's gonna shuffle the, the training data set even more, so why not? As supervised equals true, this is going to download data in tuple format with um, sample label, e.g. image label. So if it is supervised, it's going to download it in the tuple format. So it'll have this, uh, a tensor of the sample and then a tensor of the label. But we'll see what that looks like in a second. And with info equals true, this is this one here. So if you set the with info parameter to true, you get a tuple back of uh, DS info as well. And this is where you can get the class names. So of all the classes that we're doing with. So if we're downloading Food 101, we've got all of these classes here, apple pie, baklava, beef tarte, et cetera, et cetera, beef salad, yada, yada, yada. So we'll go through that in a second, but it takes, this is beautiful, right? Because this is a five gigabyte or about five gigabyte data set with 100,000 images. So where's the paper that we're beating? So where is it? Yeah, there we go. There are 101,000 images in total. Look at that, 101,000 images. Uh, 101 categories. 
So this is what we're trying to do. And the other thing that we're going to take down is, where can I put this? Is TensorFlow Mixed Precision Training. This is what you should be doing for a lot of your models, I think. If you have a GPU with Mixed Precision available, so we'll have a look at this in a second. Oh, sweet. So if I just search for Mr. D. Burke on Twitch and you can watch the previous videos, that's really cool. Okay. So, mixed precision. Here we go. This is what we're doing next or after we get our TensorFlow data set working. So mixed precision is the use of both 16-bit and 32 floating point types in a model during training to make it run faster and use less memory. Who doesn't want that in their models? By keeping certain parts of the model in 32-bit types for numeric stability, the model will have a lower step time and train equally as well in terms of evaluation metrics such as accuracy. Oh, boom! So using this API can improve performance by more than three times on modern GPUs and 60% on TPUs. That is outstanding. So this is... The, the reason why mixed precision works is... Um, we need computing precision. Yeah, in computer science, the precision of a numeric quantity is a measure of the detail in which the quantity is expressed. Yes, this is usually measured in bits, but sometimes in decimal digits. Here we go. Some of the standardized precision formats are half precision floating point, single precision floating point, double precision, etc., etc. So half precision. Half precision is a binary floating point computer number format that occupies 16 bits in, in memory. So single precision floating point is a computer number format usually copying 32 bits in computer memory. So what mixed precision training does is it uses both 16 bits and 32 bit floating point types. So generally TensorFlow's default data type is 32 bit. So that means it's gonna take up 32 bits of memory. However, you can get away with, there we go, most models use the 32, float 32 D type, which takes 32 bits of memory. However, there are two lower precision D types, float 16 and B float 16, each which takes 16 bits of memory instead. So, your accelerators can run operations faster in the 16-bit D types because they take up less of a footprint as they have specialized hardware to run 16-bit computations and 16-bit D types. So long story short, mixed precision, the data, the, the computations that your model's taking take up less space, physical space, so they can be run faster. However, somehow they result in still good, good results. So if you imagine you have one tensor of an image, by default, it's stored with 32, float 32. However, if we want it to run faster, we can store it as float 36 and then find, run a convolutional neural network over that. And then change the output, just make the output layer, change it back to float 32. This is really cool. So you need a NVIDIA GPU to do this, but that's why we're using Colab. NVIDIA SMIL. I think you need a GPU score of like seven or something like that. Here we go. Note, if running this guide in Google Colab, the GPU runtime typically has a P100 connected. The P100 has a compute capability of six and is not expected to show a... Ah, so if we are using P100, okay, I need to write this down. Mix precision, we'll go down here. Um code to do try mixed precision training see note if your GPU doesn't have a score of over 7 e.g. P100 in Colab Mixed precision won't work. See, that's an interesting note.
supported hardware. Okay, this is gonna be fun, but real fun. If you have any questions, by the way, let me know uh, in the chat, but I'm otherwise just gonna code and talk things out as I code them. Yeah, so see, this is downloading a fair bit of data from TensorFlow. It takes about five minutes. It might say, it takes about five to six minutes, really. Five to six minutes. Um, CUDA GPU web page. What GPUs are good? Here we go. So this is how we do it. We, um, there we go. From TensorFlow Keras, import mixed precision. Then we can set the global mixed precision policy to mixed float 16. That'll, that'll set the default to be float 16. Equivalent to the, so that means instead of TensorFlow's default type of float 32, we will use float 16. So let's, let's have a, have a go at a notebook here. Colab. Going to exit some of the crap that I'm in. Keynote, Chrome. So if we import TensorFlow as TF, and then we'll go TF constant one, two, three, tensor equals, and then we go tensor. This is TensorFlow's default data type, tensor.dtype. TF int 32. Oh, and if we change this to floats, TF float 32, right? And then if we go tensor 16, D type equals TF constant one, two, three. And then we set the D type equals TF load 16 and go tensor 16 D type dot D type float 16 so yeah there we go so these have the same same values right but they're stored in less precision on the computer now I don't know enough about computer science to completely explain that but the way I understand it is that if you have, a computer has a finite amount of bits that it can store things on. And so if your numbers are taking up 32 of those bits each, it's going to take up twice as much space as if your numbers are taking up float 16. However, they can represent very similar numbers. So this might actually be stored in computer memory. It's 1.0 to us, but it might actually be 0.9999999999982 because it's stored in binary format. Again, I know enough about computer science to explain that properly, but that's how I understand it. Recommended GPU for developers. Oh, Titan RTX is built for data science, AI research. Your GPU compute compatibility. No, it's too much. Just give me a table with this GPU will work or not. I don't wanna go into here. Look how many different things there are. I just want a table with, here are our GPUs, does it work with 16-bit precision mix, mixed precision? Get out. Have we got our data set downloaded? Yes, we do. Data set food 101 is downloaded and ready to go. Okay, get the class names. So what we're doing here, we just downloaded TensorFlow data set. We've got the Food 101 data set. Right now it's all in tensor format. So previously, in previous notebooks, we're talking about the previous notebooks from the course, right? We would have a bunch of images stored here. But now we don't have them because they're from um, TensorFlow data sets, which is over here. TensorFlow data sets. TFDS pro provides a collection of ready-to-use data sets with TensorFlow, JAX, and other machine learning frameworks. Beautiful. Oh, I could try out JAX with this. Maybe I'll do that on a live stream later on. JAX is getting some hype. Uh, I still haven't differentiated what, what the difference is between JAX and like TensorFlow or something, but maybe someone can tell me. So we 
get the images image tenses here and then DS info is information about that particular data set that we just loaded. So if we want to get the class names, DS info features, we need to go features label. So the label you can imagine is all the labels because it's a supervised data set. We get names. And then we got here. And now we'll take one sample off the training data. So that's what take does. And then we will, because we downloaded samples are in format image tensor label. So this is because we've set as supervised equals true, our images are going to be downloaded as tuples or our data. So it actually doesn't matter if you use TensorFlow data sets to download any of these, if it's supervised and you put as supervised equals true, you're going to get them in the format of data label. So if we go for image label in train one, which is this variable here, we have image shape. So that's the shape of the image tensor, what the data type of that image is, what the label is that's gonna be in a tensor, and then the class name, risotto. So I might actually, um, I wanna make this, I wanna make this prettier. So image shape. Very important thing when you're writing code is to make it pretty. We go here image shape and then we also want image D type and then we want image label tensor form label new line and then we get the class name class name string form why is that not working oh we need this end of the string train one. Oh, i didn't set up train one output info about our training sample Beautiful. Uh, that doesn't look too good, but that'll do. Why did that leave such a big space there? Will this work? No. Okay, there we go. So we just downloaded this from TensorFlow. How cool is that? So it's got images in the form of tensors. And if we wanted to check out what the image looked like, the image tensor, what does the image tensor look like? Okay, you went, you went eight. So the image shape, 341, 35, so that's width, height, color channels. The data type is uint8, and image label is 98, and the class name is tiramisu. So this should be an image of tiramisu. How about we try plot one of these images? Let's do that. So, to do plot an image, from TensorFlow data sets. All right, so pop quiz. How do we plot images in tensor form? Uint eight, that might be a problem. 
See, what is one of the main, if you're doing the TensorFlow course, you might know this, you might not, or if you're working with machine learning in general, what is one of the main issues you're going to run into when you're working with different tensors of different data types? I just gave away the secret there. It's a data type compatibility. So uint8, I'm not familiar with how uh, usable that data type will be because a lot of the time you'll run into the default data type float32, which is 32-bit, which is TensorFlow's default. Single precision floating point. So what we're going to do is, so want, take an image tensor from TensorFlow data sets version of food 101 and plot it to see what it looks like. Okay. How about we do that? Okay. So quiz, I need to go and pee and possibly get a towel because I'm sweating. It's hot in Australia. And maybe a drink of water and ice, but that's what we want to do. What? So the question is how we do this. That's your quiz. I'll be back. Okay, you two, you're right. Hey, Saban Mai, what's going on, man? Triple quotation for multiple lines. Oh, can I do that? Thank you. Will that work in a print statement? Oh my God. Oh. That's so cool. Thank you. Yeah, that'll work. Okay, now we want to plot this. All right. So, how we do this? Plot an image tensor. Um, from matplotlib import plt dot show image ah wait oh no who 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 saw me get that import statement wrong Import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. I always get that wrong. Hey! So simple. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Now we actually want the title. 
Um, class names. No. What's the class name? Label.numpy. Gyoza. Wonderful. Okay. Done. So that's actually really cool. So this is this is what we've downloaded from TensorFlow data sets. We've downloaded the Food 101 data set and all of our images are in tensor format of this shape. They have an image data type of uint8 and image label and the class name is Gyoza. Beautiful. So that's from our training data. Now, what we want to do as well is we want to build a model. So our model is going to go look at all these images and look at all these labels and we're going to try and beat the Food 101 paper, which got 70, can you see that? 77.4. The tattooist technologist, oh, thank you. I don't need the new lines. My string, Python strings, oh yes. And then I can just maybe even just go boom. Ah. Okay, look at this. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Helping helping each other out here. Oh, that's what's up. That looks good to me. Nice and in line. Maybe we could deal with that space. Anyway, we're not we're we're in a hacky mode at the moment. So thank you very much for that. I really appreciate that actually. Um, we're in a hacky mode at the moment so we can make our code look good later. But now we want to, this is to do turn, turn um, image and label tensors into batches for fitting. So we need a function to pre-process our images because why? They come in data type uint8 and Deep learning models, especially TensorFlow deep learning models, prefer their images in, I mean, sorry, the tensors in float32. That's why tensors, TensorFlow's default data type is float32. So this little function here, preprocess image, takes in an image and a label and a required image shape. We wanna transform all of our images to be uh, 224, 224. I don't necessarily have to, but I'm going to do that anyway. And so this, we can do that using the image resize method. And then we're going to change them from uint8 to float32. So once we pass an image label pair, so like this image and this label, to preprocessed image or preprocess image function, it's going to return uh, the resized image as well as just the label. Now, why do we have to pass the image and the label if the label actually does nothing? Well, it's because our images and labels are in tuple format. And if we come down here, when we do the map function, we pass it the preprocess image. And because on the train data, let's have a look at what the train data looks like. Train data. Options data set. See, it's in the shape. This is our image tensor here. And this is our label. So when we when we map a function to this train data, it's going to that function has to take in all of the tuples that is in that train data variable. Now, if it takes in just the image, it's going to ignore the label, and we can't do that; it'll error out. So that's why we have to do it. And here's the data types here: uint8. So we want to change that. That's the image tensor data type. We want to change that to float32. That's what our function does. And the label is int64, which is fine. That can stay there. Okay. I wonder if we, if we can plot our pre-processed image. So if I run this, Um, PLT im show 
pre processed image. Ah. Divide by 255. Ah, there we go. Okay. I'll put this here. PLT.axis false. We can still plot our pre processed image as long as we divide by 255 for matplotlib compatibility. Compatibility. Wonderful. So this is really cool actually. So we can fit into that, we can still plot it, we can download data. What do we want to do next? I'm going to... I'm going to write this here to do option two. Download pre-formatted data. Oops. So I'm going to comment out all of these. Try mix precision training. So this is only needed if to do only needed if not downloading from. See, the beautiful thing about downloading from TensorFlow data sets is that all of the data comes in tensor format. However, TensorFlow data sets is not necessarily your own custom data. So that's the caveat of using it. It's only to practice. The only reason we're downloading from TensorFlow data sets is to one, just be familiar with TensorFlow data sets in general, and two, um, have an alternative if you didn't have any pre-made data sets ready. So if you do have a pre-made data set ready, you probably don't need to download from TensorFlow data sets. So let's map. Let's pre-format our TensorFlow data sets. There we go. So what are we doing in this function? Well, we're mapping our pre-processed images Number of parallel calls is TF data to auto tune. So that's basically going to say use as many processes as you have available. And then the training data. What this does is it shuffles it a thousand samples at a time. If you really wanted to, you could uh, make this the length of your entire data set, but that will depend on how much memory you have. We're going to turn it into batches of size 32 and we're going to prefetch as many samplers, samples as we can so that. Um, when it's loading from, so this, these functions basically prepare our, our data set to tensor, to batch tensor format. And the main bottleneck of when you're training data or training things on a CPU and GPU is when you're shifting data from the CPU to the GPU. That's why the first epoch of many models takes the longest time because you're trying to load everything to the GPU. So what this basically does is it uses TF data auto tune to automatically figure out how fast it should load data from the CPU to the GPU. So it automatically does that. And then we do basically the same steps for the testing data, except we don't shuffle it. That's all. That's the only difference between the test and the um, training data set, turning them into data sets. So we started with a whole bunch of image tensors, and now we've got batch data sets in the form of still. Now we have batch size, image height, image width, color channels. That's a tensor there. This is our training data. And this is the label. And the data types is because we've pre-trained or pre-processed our images. We now have our images in TF float 32 and our labels in TF int 64. Same as before. So now let's build a model. I'm going to skip all these steps because that's only, these are only if you've downloaded them uh, and stored them in a directory. Visualize data, no, no, plot random images, no, callbacks. Do I want callbacks for now? Yeah, I'll make sure the callbacks work. Callbacks. 
I actually found that it works better without data augmentation in this case. So I'm gonna cancel data augmentation and let's go here. We're gonna uncheckpoint these. So this is also without mixed precision training. Who wants to train a model with and without mixed precision training? Me. So with mixed precision training. I could really do this tracking our experiments somewhere else, but meh. Okay. So the first model, let's kick off our first model training with mixed precision training. Without mixed precision training, sorry. So here's our base model. We have efficient net B0. We're gonna, it's a feature extractor model, so we're gonna freeze the base model layers. Input layer, base model, global average pool, the outputs of the base model, and then we pass it to a dense layer. And we have to use sparse categorical cross entropy. Why? Because our labels are not one hot encoded. So right here. Use sparse categorical cross entropy when labels are not one hot. So if we check out label, and we go again, label is one. So if our labels was something like this, No, it wouldn't have it wouldn't have another one would it if our labels were something like that that's when we'd want to drop the sparse from there okay let's run that it's going to download our efficient net and then we'll have a look model summary let's train this model together make sure it works so this is the one previously trained we've got those logs saved here so this is going to be without mixed precision training. It should be very similar to the one we trained yesterday. Now we're gonna train that. Unexpected indent, of course. Oh, here we go. Okay, so this is gonna take about five minutes, but that'll give us enough time to set up with uh, mixed precision training. Without mixed results without mixed precision. Because this is what we're gonna do as well, set up a little experiment and the model without mixed precision and with mixed precision, we wanna see what the results are. So let's go here to do try mixed precision training. And where did I put that info about mixed precision? Or maybe we put this down here. All right, let's read the guide, see what we have to do for mixed precision. Yo, Ashik, what's going on? Uh, French Toast Mafia, I would prefer specialize in a field. Healthcare, I'm really interested in health, so that's where I am I want to apply machine learning in some way, shape or form. How, I haven't quite worked that out yet, but it could be the engineer's problem, right? Once you start learning machine learning, you think it's a solution to everything, is it? Maybe, maybe not. This word really got stuck in my mind. Visualize, visualize, visualize. Oh, SLM says, why is mixed precision good? Try mixed precision training. Mixed precision training equals 
faster model training with same results. Save time. So that's the experiment that we're running right now. Results without mixed position training and eventually we want to run results with mixed precision equals model dot evaluate test data. So let's create a model. Create a model with mixed precision turned on. Um, no, we also have to turn on mixed precision training. So we want to go from tensorflow.keras import mixed precision. So this is, we're just following this guide here, right? Nothing, nothing outlandish. The beautiful thing about machine learning and deep learning is that if you can read, you can basically learn all of it. <laughs> Cause it's all online, right? Okay, here we're going to set up mixed precision. Mixed precision set global policy. Mixed float 16. So this is going to turn all of the tensors that pass through our models into float 16. What are our tensors in now? They are in float 32. We come up far out. We've got a lot of redundant code here. Yeah, but there we go. TF float 32. Right now, tensors in TF float 32. That's our data type. However, we want to pass them as float 16 through our model so that it trains faster. Do we have the right GPU? We better. Tesla T4. Yes, this should work. Okay, where are we going? Here. Try mixed precision training with mixed precision turned on. So here we go. So we can go, will most significantly improve performance on NVIDIA GPUs with a compute capability of at least 7.0. The policy will run on other GPUs and CPUs but may not improve performance. Beautiful. Okay. building the model. So the difference here you need to make for your models using mixed precision is you need to separate the activation layer. There. Incorrect. Softmax and model output will be float 16 when it should be float 32. Outputs D-type. So all you have to do is separate softmax you have to separate the activation from the output layer. Okay. So let's do this. Um, we're just gonna create the same model up here. So we'll see if we can do this without looking up there. So we want input shape equals 224, 224, three. And then base model equals TF carers applications efficient net B0. Do we want the top? Include top equals false. And then the input shape equals input shape. I don't think we actually need that there. I think we can just do that. Include top. Anyway, we'll find out in a second. Base model, turn it to trainable equals false. Don't train base model. And then we go inputs equals TF carers. I'm gonna import layers so I don't have to type out all this stuff. Import from tensorflow.carers import layers. Imports equals layers dot input. And then I think this is where we put input shape. Input shape equals input shape. We'll find out that in a second. And then we go X equals base model. 
um, inputs, and then we set training equal to false. And then we go here. We want layers dot global average pooling. So after the base model, we want a global average pooling 2D layer, 2D. And then we want we want our X layer can be layers dot dense. This is what's different to what's before. So this is what we want. Just something. All I'm doing is copying something similar to this dense and then we want len class names so this is going to be the output neurons in our dense layer it's going to be 101 len class names name equals dense and then take in x and then outputs equals layers dot activation softmax and we can copy this d type equals float32. This is going to be a really cool experiment to see. Name equals output activation. So then we can go model equals um, tfcarers.model inputs outputs come on outputs and then we want to go model.compile loss equals sparse categorical cross entropy. Optimizer, we keep stick with Atom, TF carers, optimizers dot atom. And then metrics equals accuracy because we are trying to beat the accuracy of this paper. That's what we're trying to beat. Food 101 accuracy. By the way, this paper, this, I think they're model trained for... It takes roughly two to three days non-stop for a server with an NVIDIA K40 GPU to train the model. So two to three days they took to train their model. Can we beat it in under two hours? I think we can. Okay, let's check the... Check outputs. Data type. Mixed precision, here we go. Print. Outputs D type. And then we'll go an F string. Outputs D type name. Fit, mixed precision, training model um, history mixed precision on model dot fit we could have really used a different um, variable name for our model for mixed precision and, and not mixed precision but that's all right validation data equals test data validation steps equals um, int 0.15 times len test data and callbacks equals oh I'm not going to train with any callbacks how about we do that that should work Wonderful, there we go. All right, so this is nearly finished. Then we can get the results. Do we have anything else that we need? Steps per epoch. Okay. So, if mixed precision works, these results should be very similar to the results without mixed precision. But the time per epoch should be improved. That's what we're hoping for. Did I get all this creating model correct? Oh, input shape. Did I actually need that? Seems like a bit of overkill. But that's all right. Uh, 
Um, might move this up here. Ashik, you're, co you're completely right. Mixed precision converts all the tensors into float 16, so it speeds up the training process. Yes, that that is the ideal uh, outcome of mixed precision training. Um, PyTorch has fast AI and PyTorch Lightning. Do you have any APIs like those, but for TensorFlow? Yes. So um, TensorFlow Sonnet and TensorFlow Haiku. I don't actually know the difference between these two. Sonnet, here we go. Sonnet is a library built on top of TensorFlow 2 to provide simple composable abstractions for machine learning research. So Sonnet is used by DeepMind. DeepMind, one of the biggest ML research firms or companies So this is DeepMind, this is Sonnet. I'll link this. Um, but yeah, here you go. Import TensorFlow as TF, import Sonnet as SDT. So it's actually, it's actually quite similar to TensorFlow as well. I'm struggling to understand why all these like Frameworks on top of frameworks on top of frameworks exist. Like there's like four versions of this. TensorFlow Haiku. I think Haiku is based on JAX actually. Yeah, Sonnet for JAX. Okay. So if Sonnet is a high level TensorFlow library, JAX, Haiku is a high level JAX library. And JAX is yet another numerical computing library. My God. Haiku is again that used at DeepMind. But don't you get yourself like lost up in all these sort of things? Like of course they're valuable, but for me, I like it if you're getting if you're just getting into the field, stick with one thing, like PyTorch or Fast AI. PyTorch or TensorFlow. TensorFlow or FastAI, they all do very similar things. If you want to do research, get really good at one of them. But yeah, if you want PyTorch Lightning for TensorFlow, check out Sonnet. Heaps of stars, really good. They all do basically the same thing. I have a very pretty blog on DeepMind. Here's, here's the exciting part. We're going to see if mixed precision has sped up our model. So look at this, how many, so the first epoch, 227 seconds. The second one is about 50 seconds shorter. If we get mixed precision working, hopefully these epochs are what? Shorter. Remember what we're working towards? Where's the results? Here. We're trying to beat this. The deep food paper. With just some TensorFlow code. Simply, Samarth says, can you explain a little about JAX? I'm seeing lots of hype around it. Yeah, I went to some sort of AI meetup for JAX the other day and I still couldn't figure out what the hell, like why, I mean, it looks cool, but at the same time, it's like if you're using, here, here we go, DeepMind. 
using JAX to accelerate our research. JAX, a machine learning framework developed by Google research teams. JAX resonates well. So JAX is basically NumPy on GPUs, which to me, I'm like, that's TensorFlow. TensorFlow is compatible with NumPy and also runs on GPUs. So if we look at this, JAX, Autograd and XLA. So Autograd is um, computing gradients. XLA is accelerated linear algebra. Again, this is why, why didn't someone define XLA in the first paragraph here? You can tell this is, people need to, variables and acronyms, XLA. Look at this. The documentation for JAX on XLA leads to TensorFlow, right? Accelerated Linear Algebra is a domain-specific compiler for linear algebra that can accelerate TensorFlow models with potentially no code changes. So this is what I don't get. There's about six different versions of TensorFlow. Why not just dedicate your resources to making TensorFlow really good instead of going out and building JAX as well? Who knows? If someone has an explanation on why JAX is better than just plain old TensorFlow or plain old PolTorch, happy to know. But I went to this, I went to this meetup on JAX and it literally went through like a demo JAX notebook and I'm like, I could write that code all exactly the same like that in TensorFlow. And I'm like, what is, what is, what is happening here? Anyway, that's, that's my thing. It's like as well, Okay, fair enough, if you're a research, this is what JAX might be. If like you're DeepMind and you have $500 million from Google, it's like, what do you spend your time doing? Well, you need to create a new deep learning library, obviously. Look at this, there's four, look, JAX at DeepMind, we've got Haiku, we create another, oh, just in case Haiku wasn't good enough, we created Opdax. Oh, and then if you didn't want Opdax, we've got Arlax. That's for deep reinforcement learning. Okay, I suppose that's different. Then we got checks. Chest. Checks is a collection of testing utilities used by a library, library authors to verify common building blocks are correct and robust by end users to check it. Okay, so that's good. And then giraffe. Yeah, so you see, I don't know enough about all of this. Maybe there's a good reason behind all of them. You can probably read this this um, blog post. But from what I've seen with Jax, I was just like, um, I can write the exact same stuff in PyTorch or TensorFlow. Okay, so we're going to evaluate our model without mixed precision. So this is, this is pretty darn good for five epochs of feature extraction to get, look at this, we trained our model for literally, how long is that? 200 seconds times five, a thousand seconds, what's that in minutes? 15 minutes, 15 minutes of model training and we're getting 7%, just basically 7% less accuracy than this paper that was released a few years ago and they took two to three days. AlphaFold is freaking wicked. All right, so this is what we're trying to do. Accuracy, 71.1%, 59 seconds to evaluate. Now, let's turn on mixed precision, you ready? We're turning on mixed precision, boom. Yes, your GPU will likely run quickly with the D-type policy Mix Float 16 as it has a compute capability of 7.0. Your GPU, a Tesla T4, compute compatibility 7.5. No idea, I have no idea what those numbers mean, but we're getting a thumbs up from Mixed Precision. Here we go. Creating the same model as we did before, the only difference is for Mixed Precision, your output layer needs to 
specify um, float32 D type. So our model is going to train with float16 and float32 variables. So it's going to automatically choose which ones it should train with. But for the output layer for our model to make predictions uh, pass through the activation, it should flip back to 32. I'm not entirely sure why, that's just what it says in the um, a softmax activation at the end of the model should be float32 because the D-type policy is mixed float16. The softmax activation would normally have a float16 compute D-type and output of float16 tensors. Um, yeah, there we go. Normally you can create the output predictions as follows, but this is not always numerically stable with float16. Yeah, that's why. Numerical, numerically stable. This makes our predictions more numerically stable. Okay, let's run this, see what happens. Oh, what do we get wrong? Please provide to input either a shape or a tensor argument. Um, note that shape does not include the batch dimension. Do we? I didn't include the batch dimension up here. Input shape. I'm going to can this and see what happens. What did I get wrong here? Global average. I'll type out the whole thing. And I missed some sort of connection. Yes, I did. This is with the functional model. See? Don't get this right. There we go. Outputs D type, float 32. That's what you want. Mixed precision training on. Train data, same amount of epochs, same steps per epoch, same validation data, same amount of steps per testing data. Let's do it. You ready? Do we see a speed up in epoch time? Oh, you got to remember we also, this will have a little bit more epoch time because we um, saved checkpoints. So this is the actual one that we're trying to beat. So about 155 seconds per epoch. Oh, and it should get the very, very similar results. Without data augmentation and without mixed precision training. You know, a better way to track these would be using something like weights and biases. Mixed precision feature extracted results. Feature extraction with. I need to put results at the front. That's how I've decided I want to write my results variables. Results. Results. I know my code's all over the place, but I've got the outline of it in my head. You can always come back and tidy it up later. You're seeing how the sausage is made here. You're seeing how code starts off as an absolute jumbled mess, and then when you share your notebooks, you hopefully tidy them up. All right, so we're gonna see, this is a big reveal here. It is mixed precision training speeding up our epochs. This one took 227 seconds. But again, we did try to, we did have to save the model here. And it ended on a val accuracy of nearly 68%. Oh, counting down. Oh, 
I think PyTorch has Mixed Precision Training turned on by a four, on default. PyTorch Mixed Precision, yeah, there we go. Boom, native, see, this is what TensorFlow could introduce. Native Mixed Precision. We'll read that in a second. Oh my goodness, did we get a speed up? Uh, yes, we did, but is that speed up? So again, we're trying to beat these results here. We'll see how much of a speed up there is. Most deep learning frameworks, including PyTorch, train with 32-bit floating point numeric arithmetic by default. However, this is not essential to achieve full accuracy for many deep learning models. In 2017, NVIDIA research developed a methodology for mixed precision training which combined single pre precision with half precision and achieved the same accuracy as floating point 32 training using the same high parameters with addition performance. Shorter training time, lower memory requirements and enabling larger batch size. Yeah, here we go. So Torch, CUDA, AMP. Wow. Almost a two times speed up. This is PyTorch, but. What's going on with PyTorch? Let's check out their Twitter. Oh. That is a cool animation. I want to check out this. Main M. Oh. Could I make some videos like this? Main M. Oh, I could make some view beautiful animated videos using this library. Ooh. So we're not actually seeing that much of a speed up here with mixed precision. 
So if we look over here, Epoch two out of five, we're trying to beat this here. This is without mixed precision training. I'm gonna come back to this. We're not seeing that much of a benefit with mixed precision training. So I wonder why that is. Maybe training is pretty efficient as it is. I'm gonna come back to this and use that later. I'm getting distracted. Yeah, so this is what I'm saying. Back to the jacks conversation we had before. If you want just-in-time compilation, you can use just-in-time compile equals true with TF function. I don't get it. Less things, less but better. It will be interesting to see how the results go with uh, mixed precision training versus no mixed precision training. Okay, see this is another thing with like neural networks and training them, is that anything you can do to speed them up because otherwise we have to sit here and wait for things to train. Oh, something cool. Um, connecting to a machine via SSH in Visual Code Studio. So I'm setting up my deep learning PC. So Visual Code Studio has an SSH extension which allows you to open a remote folder on any remote machine, virtual machine or container with a running SSH server and take full advantage of VS Code's feature set. Beautiful. Look at this. So I can run on my local machine, so this computer here, then I can have my deep learning PC downstairs in the kitchen, literally, and well, in my dining room. And I can connect into that and run some really fast code on it. 
Open SSH compatible SSH client. Ah, here we go. Might write an article on how to set this up myself. Here we go. All right. Now, we didn't actually see much of a speed up using mixed position training. So I might can that for this model. But are the results with mixed precision, how did they go? This is what we want to compare. Accuracy about 71% without mixed precision. And then let's go here. Beautiful. That'll be cool. So I'm going to save this. Why isn't my spotlight working? Okay, so we lose about... So we lose about 0.3 of a, which is kind of like a little bit of a rounding error. We lose about 0.3 of a percent with, with mixed precision turned on, but we don't really gain anything either. That's all right. Now what's next? I'm just gonna save this link over here first. Okay, now we want to fine tune. I wonder if fine tuning with uh, mixed precision works. We can save it. Not going to do that. Not going to load in a model. I'm gonna leave mixed precision on to see if it trains faster for fine tuning. So we've got the results here. We've got a few callbacks, early stopping. So I'm gonna monitor the, the validation loss. If it doesn't, nah, 10 epochs is too much. Three epochs. Three epochs, if validation loss doesn't improve, let's stop. Um, checkpoint. Save the best only, yes.
here we go, beautiful. And then the reduce the learning rate after our model plateaus and we'll go two. All right, let's fine tune. So currently our model is performing at 70, or just under 71% accuracy, but we're trying to get to 77.4% accuracy. So we set all the layers in the model to trainable equals true. When we first loaded our first model, uh, efficient at B0, it, it, this would be false. So now all of the layers in our model is true. I mean, trainable. Here we go here. This is our model. Did that work, actually? After we set on mixed precision training? Inputs, model. Model mixed. I'm gonna change this to model mixed, actually. and just set this off for like one epoch. Yeah, I don't think mixed precision is helping us much here. Um, what's two minutes 30 in seconds? 120 plus 30, 165. Yeah, I don't think it's working. That's all right. We'll come down here and we will fine tune. True, trainable. So now all of the layers in our base model are trainable. Before this would have been false. So we're using, um, Efficient at B0. When we first downloaded it, we set layers equals trainable equals false. So now they're all true. So let's fine tune. We're going to early stop after three epochs if it doesn't improve. And we're going to reduce the learning rate if we hit a plateau. We're going to lower the learning rate for when it first starts fine tuning. And let's rock. And let's go. We can set this to 100 epochs because we've got an early stopping callback. This is gonna take a little while per epoch. This will be really interesting to see actually, is how long it takes. Oh, did I save all of that? No. I wonder how much of a speed up we get with mixed precision and fine tuning. That is what we should have saved. I think there is a massive save up here. I've got an idea. Um, we'll make a copy of this notebook and run it simultaneously. A copy of a copy. I should have saved the outputs of this cell. That's all right. Look at this previous fine tuning though. This was with data augmentation. I 
and then without data augmentation. So we got better results without data augmentation. So I've got an idea. We're gonna make a copy of a copy. Uh, Ashik, you're saying, why am I using Google Colab when I have a deep learning PC? Um, I was making the course, the TensorFlow course, and I wanted to make sure I was using the same tool as everyone would have. So not everyone has access to copy of a copy of copy. Um, not everyone has access to a deep learning PC. So I had to make sure that everything I did worked with Colab. Uh, Lolly Lolly says, what are you doing? Is it a tutorial? No, I'm just playing around with TensorFlow. This is not a tutorial. It's just me trying out a few things with TensorFlow. I'm, I'm practicing. Actually, we've got a note. Here's what we're doing. Figure out TensorFlow data sets. Yes. Um, see if we're also seeing if mixed precision training speeds up fine tuning. Yes or no. And we're also trying to train a model to beat the deep, deep food paper for food recognition results on food 101. So 77.4 top one accuracy. So that's the type of model we're trying to build. And French Toast Mafia asks, what's the difference between checkpoints and callbacks? Um, a checkpoint is saving a model whilst you're training. So say for example, we wanted to save it at the end of Epoch 1, we could create a checkpoint. That way we could load in from that checkpoint and it would start training with the same results that it had at the end of Epoch 1. Whereas a callback, a checkpoint is a callback. A callback is extra functionality that you can add to your model while it's training. So for example, we have a model checkpoint callback which saves only the best model during training. We have an early stopping callback, so the model stops training after, after X epochs of no improvement. And we have a reduced learning rate callback, which reduces the learning rate after X epochs of no improvement. However, there are a lot more callbacks than what we have there. TensorFlow callbacks. Callbacks. Here we go. Abstract base class used to build new callbacks. Boom. So this is what all the callbacks in TensorFlow. Now, where were we? We answered some questions. Now we have copy of a copy and we're gonna start running this. We might have to kill one of our existing notebooks. I believe that is really fast compared to what we just had for fine tuning. That is very fast fine tuning. Okay, we get a Tesla T4. Now, this notebook, we can delete a whole bunch of crap. Oh, that's gonna take a while, isn't it? But we can delete a whole bunch of crap from here. Because this is gonna be just a, so this is how you can structure your notebooks, is you just wanna be a very, one specific example at a time. So this is what copy of a copy is doing. I'm just gonna get rid of all the shit we don't need out of this one. Oops. Edit, undo. Now this one we actually wanna keep mixed precision off. Callbacks, don't need.
Wow. I think mixed precision is absolutely destroying this fine tuning. So this is, okay, this is where mixed precision is coming in helpful. This is exciting. But we can really compare it here. So I'm gonna wait for this notebook to finish loading the data. We deleted a whole bunch of stuff. Great definition of callbacks, Ashik. Thank you for that. Really appreciate it, brother. All right, so the current experiment we're running is we're comparing this notebook. This is, has this has mixed precision turned on, and this one is going to have mixed precision turned off for fine tuning. So this one took 308 seconds for an epoch. Now that is absolutely insane compared to this previous experiment that I did, it took 1400 seconds. That's a very long time. But that had data augmentation turned on, but didn't have mixed precision turned on. We have a lot of experiments running here. Hey Ashik, what's the, what's the machine learning practitioner's motto? precision and with data augmentation. So I'm going to go to the bathroom quickly again and then uh, I've been drinking so many fluids. I'm very hydrated. We'll wait for both of these to finish and then we can do a test. Again, the test that we're doing here is comparing mixed precision on the left and no mixed precision during fine tuning on the right. Okay. Oh, data's nearly loaded over here. Yes. Wow, that's going pretty quick. 300 seconds per epoch. I wonder how long it would take if we weren't. And validation loss is going down. Mixed precision is crushing it over here. Holy crap. What's four minutes and seconds? 240 seconds. Beautiful. So tomorrow, let me know if you wanna see me stream again tomorrow. I think tomorrow will, or let me know if you even like these streams, you know? Cause these streams are not really, I'm just running experiments. I'm not really teaching anyone anything. I'm just trying to see what it's like, but this is actually how a lot of code is done. Is you just, you're trying things out. Again, people are probably more neater than me and not having copy of copy notebooks, 
But the only reason I'm doing this is because I want to compare two very specific things on a very specific problem. If I was doing higher level experiments, maybe I would uh, not have this, but I'm developing code for upcoming project, milestone project, food vision, and I want to incorporate a couple of things that we haven't covered in the previous modules of the TensorFlow course. And that is mixed precision training, whether it works. So that's what I'm testing. I'm testing to see if mixed precision training works. You know what I should have actually done? I should have done it on a smaller version of the data set rather than a larger version. So tomorrow's live stream, if I get on, we will probably be um, tidying up this notebook code. Oh, are we ready? Oh, there we go. Shuffling and writing examples to root TensorFlow datasets food 101. Beautiful, thank you very much. Needs to do it for that. So that's the training data there. Can you see that? 75,000 examples, training data. And this is going to do it for the testing data as well. On the left, mixed precision. On the right, no mixed precision. Boom, food 101 data set ready. We'll make sure it's all, all legit, make sure all these other cells work. Oh, that's a good question, Ashik. When to use a neural net for a regression problem and when not to use one? does scikit-learn get better results? I would say the best way to figure that out is to run an experiment because I don't know off the top of my head because it really depends on what your use case is. The reason why I teach that um, building a, a regression problem with a neural net is because of things like object detection, you will often code up a neural network to figure out the points on the image where the, the bounding box is located. And that's a regression problem. Which of course, scikit-learn can do that as well. But for simpler problems, I would say scikit-learn might be better because it's it's got a, it could be faster. Won't necessarily need a GPU for fast compute. It all depends. So I would say random forest regressor will probably be better than the neural network code for the regression problem. But the main thing I was trying to get across with that neural network regression is the input and output shapes of a regression problem. So that's actually the main, one of the main things I try to get across the whole course is with any problem that you're working on, one of the main like challenges you're going to come across is getting your data into the right input and output shapes. So I just need to fine tune this model without mixed position training over here. Cause I need to keep reminding yourself on the left is mixed precision on the right is no mixed precision. And I don't want to save the logs. Oh, it looks like our loss just went up, but we've checkpointed the best one. Do we turn all of the layers to Tra trainable. Yes, we did. So we've got to wait for this to fit. See, this is where we could have saved our model. I believe we can actually, we might be able to skip this. Because did I, 
I just deleted all this import save model code, didn't I? I got an idea. Let's can that. Because I did. There we go. All we're looking at is the time per epoch. Does that not exist? Um, Yes, a baseline in scikit-learn and then proceed with TensorFlow would probably be, yeah, start with a simple model and then go with a neural network after that. That's how I would approach it. TensorFlow, food vision. Did I not? Okay, now drives connected. Wonderful. Okay, so we've got a model training here. Look at all this loading code going on. This is what up. Now let's check our model layers trainable. Model.layers print layer.name layer.trainable I believe when you load a model that yeah the default is they're all set to true we'll set them to true anyway now we'll check all the layers in the base model make sure that they're trainable true 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 no we want oh this has got data augmentation Ah, uh, our save model has data augmentation, so we... Uh, that's all right. We will keep hacking this code <laughs> until we get what we want. And that is a comparison between mixed precision fine tuning and non-mixed precision fine tuning. We're going to see an interesting result here. Is our validation loss going up or not? What are we trying to beat? We're trying to beat the paper here. 77.4% top one accuracy. See, this is a cool paper because look what they're trying to do. They recognize obesity as a disorder involving excessive body fat that increases the risk of type 2 and cardiovascular disease. In 2014, about 13% of the world's population were obese. 13%. Accurate estimation of dietary intake is important for assessing the effectiveness of weight loss interventions. In order to reduce bias and improve the accuracy of self-report, we propose new algorithms to analyze the food images captured by mobile devices, e.g. smartphone. The key technique innovation in this paper is deep learning based food image recognition algorithms. Our proposed algorithms are based on convolutional neural network. Our experimental results on two challenging data sets using our approach exceed the results from all existing approaches. Ho ho! 
Uh, validation loss is starting to go up. So this is what we've done. Reduce the learning rate. If validation loss starts to increase, we reduce the learning rate. Hopefully it works, maybe it won't, maybe it will. So we're waiting for this to go through. Probably be five minutes or so. This is really fun actually. Now, how would we get this into a... So, um, what's that tutorial website? Machinethink.net. Blog. There we go. Coromel. Oh. If you already have a model. Ah, oh, how do I hire this guy? I want to put this model into a smartphone app. Oh, how to display vision bounding boxes. So this is how you, this is how you get your services out there. The only reason I know this guy is because he has a blog on machine learning and Swift. If you want to get found on the shit that you do with ML, write about it. And then we go to his Twitter and his GitHub. Pretend I was, I want to hire this guy because I know that he can work on CoreML. Swift for TensorFlow is dead. That means Python for TensorFlow is still going. What's a surf classifier? Scalable, efficient, and fast classifier. That's cool. Design a model, use an architecture that is suited as a problem, collect and clean the data. This is a great website of this uh, explaining services. See, this is what's up. If you want, people to be able to find out what you do and hire you for shit. I would hire this guy. Look at these blog posts. I haven't even read half of them and I'll hire him. Coromel survival guide. It's pretty easy to use except when it doesn't do what you want. What are the chapters in here? How to best convert your models to Coromel. So this is what this paper was originally trying to do. It was trying to build a food recognition algorithm that could be used on a mobile device. So if I wanted to take this model that I've trained from TensorFlow and get it onto, I don't even have my phone, it's in the other room because I don't want to get distracted. If I wanted to put it on a phone in an app. Okay, here we go. Should I just buy this book?
This is a great website too, Ray Winderlich. Lich. Who wants to see me build this into an app? Where's the button to say no cookies? All right. This could be potential streams going forward. Is build. Building this into an iOS app. Food Vision. Right, that could be an extension for this course. We build a model, Food Vision, and then we build it into an app. We've got to do that on the live stream first. Look at this, how cool is that? TF Core ML. TF Core ML. Convert from TensorFlow to Core ML. Oh. Core ML tools. Oh, great. Core ML tools. Here we go. Core ML is an Apple framework to integrate machine learning models into your app. Yes. Core ML provides unified representation for all models. Your app uses Core ML APIs and user data to make predictions and to fine tune models all on the user's device. <gasps> yes. Core ML optimizes on device performance by utilizing, where's TensorFlow? Yes. This includes deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras, Cafe. Convert trained models. Here we go. Oh, this is so exciting. When you find a new set of tools that can help you do what you want. Okay, I need to look at that later. Where are we up to? It stopped training. There we go. Okay, so early stopping has kicked in. So this was using, I'm gonna come back to this. How much is this website? 40 bucks a month. to learn how to build iOS apps. That could be future streams. I build food vision in an iOS app. Let me know if you wanna see that. Okay, so this is the results with mixed precision turned on. Need to save this here. With mixed precision turned on. Food 101 is a multi-class classification problem. Uh, yeah, so that'd be, I reckon, a cool project, Ashik. What do you reckon is to, uh, this is, this is, a, mo uh, this is a, a big network that lives in a notebook right now, but what if we could use it on a mobile phone? So example, you could take a photo of any food in the class names and then the mobile phone would tell you on the app, the app would tell you which, which food class it thinks it's most likely. 
I think that'd be a really cool project. So this is with mixed precision turned on. Let's see the results. Evaluating, fine tuning, without data augmentation and with mixed precision turned on. Results, fine tuned model with mixed precision equals model dot evaluate. Here's a moment of truth. Did we beat the paper? Fine tuned model with mixed precision. Did we beat the paper? Here's what we need. Look at this. This, this has just been a, a barely a two hour coding session. And we, we might have beat the paper, I don't know. We'll find out. And without mixed precision turned on. And we're still waiting here, nearly done here. This is exciting, comparing how it makes... Boom, Ashik, I think you've got a... Uh, I think I'm on the same page as you, my friend. I think that's what we're gonna do for um, uh, future live streams. After the course materials are all finished and the course is fully out, I think I know what project I'm gonna work on. We'll get out of that. I'll come and have a look at that later. And... Where's the table of contents for this? Table of contents, here's what we do. The CoreML ecosystem. What is CoreML? Converting models. Examining models, model surgery inside the app. Yeah, sweet. <laughs> Boom, look at that. We just, we just beat food, deep food paper. Look at that, 79.3% top one accuracy. They got 77.4 and, and takes two to three days non-stop for that. Hours took under two hours. That's the power of TensorFlow and deep learning and pre-trained models and transfer learning. Look at that. And mixed precision training. Under two hours. This is a previously trained model. We didn't beat it, but it turns out we did if we remove data augmentation. So we're gonna update this to do. Update text, we did beat it without data augmentation. That is so exciting. <laughs> um, okay, without mixed precision, we'll run that. We'll make sure mixed precision is turned off for this notebook. We'll run that. Ladies and gentlemen, we just beat deep food paper. Beat the deep food paper. <laughs> and I'm gonna bookmark this. Boom, boom. See, this is also very smart, is to make smaller courses. I think my course is probably too long. So maybe my TensorFlow course is like 40 hours. These are like very specific courses on different things. So 298 courses. So maybe that's what I should do next time, is instead of making a 40 hour course, I make like a four hour course on something really specific. Maybe that's a better option. But I need to build something first. All right, I'm getting distracted by that. We need to come back, get out, get out. So we've beat the, we beat the deep food paper. 
Beat the deep food paper. Okay. How exciting. That is so, so exciting. Okay, now here, we wanna see if all the layers are trainable, yes. Fine tuning, now, now here's what we're doing. We're comparing fine tuning, mixed precision, to non-fine tuning mixed precision. All right, so this is this is the crucial thing, how long this epoch takes. So let's compare. Got a lot of experimental stuff going on here, but I'll sort it out later. What did I get wrong here? Wow. Look at that. Is this actually going to take 12 minutes? Mixed precision has just blown this out of the water. It's still way faster than that. How long's 1400 seconds? 23 minutes. That is absolutely wild. I'm actually skeptical at what if we've actually got this right because of how much of a time saver that is. We do know that our model doesn't have data augmentation on. A sheik, that is a great. <laughs> I got too, I got too excited with the clap. My bad, brother. Uh, take a photo, a picture of chicken, and model detects chicken generates a different recipe for chicken. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Why don't we build that? I need to finish this course first, and once that's finished, then I can work on projects. I can't believe this is taking ten minutes per epoch. This mixed precision, we just absolutely smashed it. We might wait for the first epoch to finish and then make sure that the second one doesn't take a ridiculous amount of time and just see, I think mixed precision has really kicked into gear for fine tuning. So this is where we're up to now. See if mixed precision training speeds up fine tuning. Time per epoch. without mixed precision. This is a really hacky way of storing experiment results, but stuff it. With mixed precision. But we actually did beat the deep food paper model. That's what's up, man. We beat it. Tomorrow we're gonna probably work through and refine this once we've figured out our uh, if mixed precision really speeds it up here. Might rerun this notebook just once overnight, just to see if it really does. I haven't tried Paperspace in a while, actually. Paperspace.com.
gradient. Yeah, this is cool. I hate these little chat things. API endpoint. There's so many options here. I need to go through and build a full stack machine learning application to experience what these tools have to offer. That's my next project. After the course is done, we're building something full stack. We're gonna build a data flywheel. That is outstanding if that is, if this is, this is legit. Mixed Precision has, I'm blown away by Mixed Precision. We beat Deep Foods paper with mixed precision turned on and our model trained in 15 minutes. <laughs> 15 minutes! What the... What the hell? Can you believe that? 15 minutes. For TensorFlow 2.0 offers six hours of free fast GPU. Yeah, that's that's good. That's a good amount, but we're also, Colab, I mean, I've been using a Tesla T4 for the past, this whole stream, so. What's, Twitch is giving me a notification. Three new friend requests. What does Mixed Precision do? Great question. Lolly lol. So mixed precision, let's come up here. I'll let you, I'll link this docs as well. So new feature in TensorFlow 2.4. So mixed precision uses both 16-bit and 32-bit floating point types in model during training to make it run faster and use less memory. So by keeping certain parts of the model in 32-bit types, so 16 and 32-bit floating point types essentially means, okay, so if we store X, this one number, it takes up 32 bits of memory in a computer. Let's say a computer has a total of 1,000 bits memory. So if we store them at 32 bit, we can store about 30 of them. But if we store them at 16 bit, we can store about 60 of them. And so the difference between 32 bit and 16 bit is how I understand it, is 32 bit is more accurate. What that means is precision in computing. So if we, we need to look up this, this is precision in computing. So I'll, I'll link this. So precision in computer science is how precise a computer stores numbers. I don't know enough about computer science to talk about that, but if we talk about single precision floating point format, it stores it in 32 bits. You can see that there. So the default is 32 bit. But then if we go to half precision, it stores them with less numbers. So less bits. So that allows your GPU, if it's compatible with mixed precision training, uh, to calculate more numbers at the same time on 16-bit than if they were stored in 32-bit. Now, also the tricky thing about this where it doesn't really make sense to me is that even though it's calculating patterns on numbers that take up half the amount of space, so it's the storage in memory, it still ends up with results that are the basically the exact same as if they were calculated on 32-bit. So where does it go? So yeah, using this API can improve performance by more than three times on modern GPUs. So this is what we're seeing live here actually. All right, so this epoch took 308 seconds. This is using mixed precision training. And this one, it's not even finished yet. So it's taken 10 minutes or so, so far. So if the model on here on this side gets the same results in the model on here, but this model 
saw a speed up of three times, maybe more than three times, then that's the benefits of mixed precision training. It should be turned on by default, if you ask me. Does that make sense? So mixed precision training in short, it uses different types of ways to store numbers on a computer. Um, and one of those types is more efficient or more memory efficient than the other type, but still stores basically the same information. And so because it's taking up less space, uh, our computer, our GPU is able to make more calculations faster because it's got more availability in, in space to, to make those calculations. But those calculations have the same precision as if they were working with the higher space number. So conceptually, intuitively, it kind of makes sense. How it actually works behind the scenes, I'm not entirely sure. I just run experiments like this and hack around for a bit to, to try and understand in my brain. Should I use this or should I not use this? All right. We will know at the end of this epoch whether it's worth doing or worth, or we ignore it. Yes, you're right. Behind the scenes, you probably need a whole bunch of computer science. So the precision of a numerical quantity is a measure of the detail which the quantity is expressed. Woo. This is usually measured in bits, but sometimes in decimal digits. It is related to precision in mathematics, which describes the number of digits that are used to express a value. Okay, well, that's, there we go. So, hmm. Precision is often the source of rounding errors in computation. The number of bits used to store a number will often cause some loss of accuracy. There we go. An example would be to store sine 0.1 in IE single precision floating point standard. The error is then often magnified as subsequent computations are made using the data, although it can also be reduced. Ah. It's actually really cool how it works. Really cool. But I'd read a combination of the TensorFlow documentation. In this guide, the term numeric stability refers to how a model's quality is affected by the use of lower precision data type uh, instead of a higher precision data type. We can say an operation is numerically unstable in float 16 or bfloat 16 if running it in one of those D types causes the model to have worse value ac evaluation accuracy or other metrics compared to running the operation in float 32. Okay. Very cool to me. The utility of it is that I, as a model builder, get faster models or faster training on my models, but still the same results or very close to the same results. Well, we're looking at, we're getting very similar results here. This is, again, on the right here is without mixed precision. On the left here is with mixed precision. Three, two, one, we need to evaluate. So basically the same, or even a little bit, a little bit better on the mixed precision notebook then we're comparing this value. So that took 789 seconds, oh my goodness. Look at that, 789 versus 308. 789 divided by 308. We just got a two and a half times speed up using mixed precision. The documentation actually didn't lie. Using this API can improve performance by more than three times on modern GPU. Look at that. This epoch took 789 seconds. Same data, same model setup. This epoch took 308 seconds. And now look, again, we've got the epoch number two. Epoch two, this is 299 seconds. This thinks it's gonna take 13 minutes. Let's just round that up. So 13 times 60, 780 seconds. Oh my goodness. That is an absolute beast. Lolly lol, that is a great definition of mixed precision training. What it says is we don't need to do the, the calculations with the highest precision. The end result is indeed very close to the same results, not for all the calculations anyway. That is 
beautiful. That's a great definition. But that is amazing. Look, what, look, 789 seconds. So what is that again? 2.5x with mixed precision turned on, we see a 2.5x speed up. Speed up in model training with basically the same results. That is outstanding. Absolutely outstanding. Validation accuracy, 77. Exact same number. Validation accuracy, 77.12. But a two and a half times faster epoch. If you're fine tuning, turn on mixed precision. Wow. All right, so I'm gonna let this run because that's basically where we're up to. That's kind of what we wanted to do for this stream is to try out mixed precision training for model 07, see if, yes it is. We'll go here. Mixed precision numbers whilst fine tuning. So tomorrow we're probably going to um, clean up this notebook. We've decided that yes, we are going to use mixed precision for fine tuning, clearly. I'm gonna keep this running and just see how long each of these epochs take. Um, copy of a copy, fine tune results. I'll run that afterwards. And I'll get out of this, boom, copy. That. We've got to clean up our notebooks tomorrow and then number seven will be ready to go. That's what we want to do for tomorrow is have number seven ready to go. However, I'd want to for number seven, the milestone project is to, because rather than me go through it all, I'd rather just create a skeleton of model seven. That's what, that's what I'm going to do for notebook seven, actually. I'm going to have the notebook with all the code of how I would do it. And then I'm going to, the actual notebook that I'll go through is to go, hey, here's the different headings. So I'll just have a notebook with different headings. And then it's a challenge for someone to go through and fill out all the code. And if they need a hand, well, they can go through um, the example notebook and do their own version there. But mixed precision training has absolutely blown my mind. Absolutely blown my mind. Look at this, it's still taking about eight minutes per epoch. I haven't got time for this. I've got to go, I'm gonna go for a walk. But thank you so much for everyone who tuned into the streams. Ashik is linked fast, fast AI's documentation about mixed precision. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to save that and read that, read that through later. But um, I'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, I think you'll be able to watch this later at, on Twitch if, if uh, you're looking at this later. I'm not sure how that works, but peace out. We learned in this notebook, what did we learn? We learned that mixed precision is very good for big net networks. And we also learned about TensorFlow data sets. How do I end this stream? Here we go. Love you all. Keep learning. Keep moving.